was the singer. I've been in a band, you know, talking when, when playing with Kevin in, in the Dubro Quiet Riot thing where I had lead singers, but I always liked being the lead singer because I wanted to be that, you know, the front man that is a guitar player singer like Eric Clapton or, you know, or Hendrix or whoever, Frank Marino, love Frank Marino. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, so uh, yeah, that was a game changer, definitely. And, uh, you know, little things like that make you step up your game and make you better because then sure. you see what your real competition is because the competition at least for me, was not the local kids in my high school or nothing. I was way advanced past them, even in, you know, in eighth or ninth grade, I was already playing the school assemblies and stuff in junior high school. Mm -hmm. So to see some guys like that, that it were already established and they had a great band. And that's one thing I didn't have was a great band. The drummer, you know, and the bass player I had at the time, they were good. They were my high school buddies, but they weren't like that world-class thing. And that didn't happen for me until I met Gary Holland, who originally was named Gary Hallinan. He came from New York and my best friend at the time ran into him, I believe at a laundromat and they started talking and one thing led to another. They exchanged and gave him my number. And as soon as we played together, man, it was like, wow, this is how it's supposed to be. Right. This guy is a great drummer. He sings his ass off. And we had, we started that band sweet 19 together. Right. S U I T E one nine. And we played hundreds of gigs locally and, had an incredible following and went through a, quite a few bass players. Couldn't seem to hang on to bass players more than a year or so. Um, for whatever reason, the first guy was scared of success. And when things started really happening, the pressure of it was too much for him. So he quit. And then we went to a number of other people. And then, uh, you know, I did a show with Dawkin at a place called the, uh, the Rock Corporation. And he really dug what I was about and got in touch with me. And though how he got my number was my road crew accidentally put his marshals into my equipment van. So I get this phone call the, the, the next morning and it's Don Dawkin on the phone. He goes, Hey, uh, my name is Don. We did a show last night together and I think you got my marshals. And I, I didn't know they put them in there. So I go, no, I don't think so. And he goes, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure you do. I go, well, I can go check my van if you want, you know? And so I said, call me back in five minutes. So I went up to my van, moved some, sure enough. All the old, early, early Marshall heads were in the little small box, 50 watts. Right, right. And, um, and, and a couple of hundred watts. And so uh, I knew uh, I knew they were his because I didn't even own a Marshall head at that time. It was all Marshall bottoms and fender heads. Mm -hmm. And so he calls me back and he came up to pick him up. We started talking and he just loved what I was doing. He liked my voice. And he goes, man, we ought to do a band together with two lead guitar players you know, when two lead singers and we get the bass player and the drummer to sing, we got four. I go, I, that's what I want is I want harmonies because I was a big fan of Boston too. And I love the harmonies they had. It just made it so musical and memorable. Right. And there was so much joy in their singing. And Don had a great voice. I'm a good singer. And uh, so we did that. I brought my drummer Gary in. And you got, you can't shut me up once I start. No, go ahead. Okay. And uh, we did a European tour. I think it was about 28 days or 25 days after we did our first rehearsal. And Don, Don and I on the plane to Europe, 12 hours, writing lyrics to the songs. Hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of Well, I think that's good. You should change that. And we got there. We did a rehearsal or two. He knew some people over there that put us up in a, in a place above a bar in Hamburg, Germany. And we did a bunch of shows over the course of two months. And that was my first time out of the I was going to ask you about that, about, about that in particular. And I have this album. I don't know whether this is you on it or not, but this is this this bootleg thing. Do you, remember, do you recognize that back yeah, in the street? I've never, I've never seen that cover. I've seen that picture, but I've never seen that picture disc before. Yeah, back in the streets, felony, day after day. And it says George is on this, but. Yeah, it's probably really, George. It's I probably think. George. George came in after me. I, you know, I, I still talk to Don. We're still friends. I, I there was some stuff going on that I'm a real meat and potatoes type of guy. When I smell bullshit, my ears perk up and I start listening. But I smelt a lot of bullshit back then, which a lot of people that have been in that band. Don's a great guy, but there was just stuff going on that I, I wasn't going to base my career on. So after about a year with that, I left to form my own band. And that's when I started the Greg Leon Invasion. Right, right. But before yeah. that, I, I was in Dawkins and he was, I mean, I was in, you know, Dubrow, and he kept still chasing me down, showing up to my shows. And then he calls me this one, and I was getting sick of Kevin too. Kevin was very hard to get along with in those days. He was the most opinionated guy and a lot of fun to be with. Some of the most fun times I've ever had in my life were with that guy. I mean, it was a party all the time and 
you know, the, the girls, the drugs, the whole thing. It was just fun all the time. Right. And playing good shows that were always sold out. But he was just hard and to get along with and very argumentative. And I don't like to argue. I mean, if a band's not fun and you're not laughing and having a good time and telling jokes and the camaraderie of a band, to me, it's not even worth being in. If you're fighting, it's, it's like being in a relationship with somebody that you're fighting with all the time. Why would you do that? Right. It's supposed to be fun, enjoyable. So, you know, again, after about a year of that, I, Don had been after me and he said the magic words or the magic sentence, I have European dates. I go, wait, 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 wait a minute. Because I'm thinking Hendrix. It took Hendrix getting out of the States to, to get make his mark. Right. So I'm thinking, OK, well, maybe. Maybe that's what it needs to do, you know, and uh, what I need to do. So I quit. I went with Don, like I said, 28 days, 25 days later. We're damn, we're, you know, on our way to Europe. The dates were already booked. We met Dieter Dirks. We went to the studio, did a demo. Uh, Dieter and I produced it, basically, and in Cologne, uh, Germany. It was it was magical. But again, there was these things that kept popping up that were not true. And I was 100 percent true. They weren't. I mean, 100 percent positive. They were not true. And it just. You know, at, when you're 22, 23, you know, it's a young man's game. And I'm thinking, man, I don't like it when somebody lies to me and I find out it's a lie and they still swear to it. Mm. So, you know, and, uh, you know, Don, all he was trying to do is to keep the band together and keep everybody up, you know, up and, and moving ahead with it. Sure. But I took that as uh, there, this is bullshit. There's some bullshit going on. And right. so when we got back to the States and then we did a bunch of showcases and, uh, you know, all the labels were saying the same thing to us, you know. Hey, man, this heavy metal shit's done. The last uh, guitar band to get signed was Van Halen. We're not looking for that. You guys ought to listen to the knack. You got to listen to, you know, Devo. And there's given a stack. Some of them gave us stacks of records of this new wave stuff that's coming. God, you guys got to cut your hair and get rid of that denim. This stuff isn't happening no more. And here we had just come back from Europe. And it was totally happening. People were standing. We did this one place called the Fabrique. And the word was traveling about Don and I and, uh, you know, the band, how good it was. And uh, we went there for sound check about noon. We, no, we didn't go on until about eight o'clock that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was snowing like hell. I mean, just ice cold, freezing. And me being a Southern California boy, I'd never even seen snow before. <laughs> I, was, I was all enamored with it, you know, and I'm okay. like, oh, man, this is awesome. Right. And so freezing. I mean, I wasn't didn't dress for the freezing cold there. You know, I'm used to Southern California. So anyways, we go there, we do the sound check and we come out after the sound check. There is a line two blocks long, four people deep, all the way around the block at about one o'clock, 12 noon or one o'clock. Doors don't even open till like 6.45 that night. Um, I forgot what was, where I was going with this, but just the enthusiasm of that and them telling us that it's over and I'm, we're going, no, 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 you guys don't understand. We just came from Europe. This is what's coming. Mm -hmm. This kind of music is what's coming. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted to push their their the knack and you new know all wave. these new wave. The, yeah, new wave and rock, right? I mean, that was yeah. what was in, in in the states, and then you know Van Halen was, I guess, the the exception to that situation. Yeah, and I guess you know going back to some of the Van Halen stuff, you uh, you know that that period, like you said, Van Halen had just kind of poked through. It took, you know, a couple of people have said this recently that it took them a while to to actually pick up speed and for that period to kind of settle with the new wave and the uh, yeah. punk. What was it, 80 by the time that kind of calmed down? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Because yeah, you had was, disco too in there. Oh, yeah, but you got to remember disco. Right. We, used, we were the house band at a club called the Starwood in Hollywood and we played Gazzari's and the Whiskey and the Roxy and. Hey, tell me, tell me about, tell me about the three main clubs that you played: Starwood, Whiskey, and and well, the Roxy was one of them too, right? The Gazarius was more because that was that was more people friendly. You know, you would go there and just hang out all night. There right. was you know two guys to every two girls to every guy. Uh, they had three stages, so there was never more than five minutes between bands. Three stages. Uh, had, I heard it too. Great, yeah. They had a stage upstairs and then one left and right, and. Uh, we were the house band there for, God, a couple of years, and Bill Gazzari played the heck out of us. He loved us. In yeah. fact, he even told Robert Hilburn about us, and there was a story in the L.A. Times about this is the next band to watch out for. Right, right. And uh, So what kind of club? You, you just said it was more friendly. What do, what do you mean? Well, 
it was they would let underage kids. Well, the star would let underage people in there, too. But I mean, uh, Gazari was, was just they were they were lax on the rules and stuff. It was about going there, having a good time, hanging out all night, having some drinks, mm-hmm. you know, dancing all night. They had uh, a wet T-shirt contest all the time and Miss Gazari's concerts, all the uh, uh, contest all the time. Right. So there would be hundreds of beautiful. I mean, just drop dead gorgeous girls there the whole time. And, you know, the bands would guys the bands would hang out there and it just people came from, you know, 50 miles any direction and just spent their Friday and Saturday nights there. Right. Uh, and you could go next door to the to the rainbow and have, you know, a pizza or a burger or whatever you wanted. Right. I caught actually before they closed it, I caught it. I actually was at the real Gazzari's before they closed it. I think it was yeah. nine, early 90s. But yeah. I, but back uh, at that period, the whiskey, the way I've read it anyway, is that it was more for originals. Yeah. And it was yeah. more showcase room. Yeah. Yeah. We went there the first time and we did probably half. It was so funny. We did about half original and half cover. But we had so many people because, like I said, we were playing the, the parties all the time. So all of Glendale, every time I played, all of Glendale was there. I mean, right. it was incredible. And we went into Hollywood. We took all that crowd with us and they were all just coming of age, 18, 19 years old. So everybody was looking for a place to go. We were their band, you know. And uh, so we would play these clubs and completely pack them out. They wanted us right back. Mm-hmm. So that's when I you know, started writing more songs and, you know, it was the beginnings of writing songs. So I wasn't that great of a songwriter. So the, but I remember we got an encore and the guy at the side, come on, you guys got to end. But the crowd was going crazy for us. So we come back in and we did, uh, Oh God, what was it? Uh, day of the Eagle, I think. And I did like a five minute extended solo on it. Yeah. So we got another 10 minutes out of it. And, uh, it was just funny. I and mean, we'd play tricks like that every once in a while. If we were really in the mood to play and the crowd was really into what we would go for the encore and just pick the longest song we knew. And, <laughs> so and, this uh, is, yeah. this is which club at we, which club was, you Well, we did that at the, uh, at the whiskey. Okay. And uh, I never liked playing the whiskey cause I don't like playing where it, the, it's a V, you know, that goes in the back with the drummers and then it comes out at an angle. Yeah. It's like you're playing in the corner of a box. Whereas uh, most clubs, you play the the backline is in a straight line, yeah. And in my it. studio, it's it's set up like that. So you get a residence issue with that with a V stage, you get that sub problem. Sometimes it's sometimes you don't have any. Sometimes you got too much. It's a whole yeah. bunch of different problems. It never sounds right to me. But funnily enough, every time we played there, everybody would, man, that's the best you guys ever sounded. Oh, it was really? amazing. And the whole time I'm on stage, go man, this sucks. What the hell is with the sound? And it spooks you a little bit, you know. Yeah. What about the Starwood? Now, con- contrast the Starwood to those two places. What kind of place was it? That place was the best club on the planet Earth. Really? We They had a huge stage. And uh, when we first started playing, though, they had a good PA. Then they closed down for a couple of weeks and they had JBL come in there. And they uh, they completely refitted everything with JBL monitors, JBL mains, JBL subs. You had side fills that were like six, seven feet tall. Um completely uh, flattened the room out, had a new board and they had a, a sound booth upstairs and the guy could see down and he had monitors in there that were EQ'd to the ones on the floor. So he could hear exactly what the people downstairs were hearing mm-hmm. and they would flatten the room out every day, flatten the board out and start fresh every day. Mm-hmm. And we would usually do a three day run there with two shows a night, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Right. And great guarantees. Everybody loved going to the Starwood and they gave you a big box with like 2000 tickets. So you went to every record store and it had your name on it and who was opening for you or who you were opening for. And you just left a stack of 50 at every uh, music store and any place kids would go. And uh, it was always jam packed. I mean, 500 people in the, in the concert room, they clear everybody out. And then for the next show, 500 more kids. And this went on for a couple of years and there was all kinds of like uh, back rooms upstairs where dressing rooms and this rooms of, you know, you wanted to be alone or you met somebody. I've heard about those rooms. Yeah. <laughs> all of that's true. That's all true. And, you know, being the house band, we were privy to all that. And right. we were there, me and the guys in the band, we would go there. I would venture to say for a long time, six nights out of the week, we'd go to rehearsal and go there and hang out, mm-hmm. you know, have a drink, whatever. And, uh, you know, and, and come to find out, which I knew at the time, it was actually a front for drugs. And they were like the biggest co- uh well, a little bit of cocaine, but mostly quaaludes at the time. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, I read that. that. I remember being in the office a few times and there's, they'd be doing their deal and they would be dropping literally 
and I saw this with my own eyes, and Kevin Dubrow and I saw this with our own eyes, literally um, pillows, the size of real pillows loaded with 10,000 quaaludes, and maybe 10 or 15 of these coming through there. And uh, they'd always throw us some, you know, and that was the thing at the time, you know. They were fun. I mean, they were really fun. And, you know, none of this stuff was, you know, addictive habit forming or kill you like that. Unless you tried to drive on a quaalude, then you're definitely going to (laughs) crash. But uh, it was just fun. You know, we were young kids, man. We were indestructible. Nothing could hurt us, you know. So we're partying, we're meeting people and having fun. And even after parties, people would have like a hotel room and they say, hey, there's a party at my hotel. And, you know, they'd go there and we'd go there and we'd, you know, hang out till the sun was coming up. And so tell me. Tell me about the Roxy at the time, too. I, I, I know a little history, but... but The Roxy, to me, we played there probably a dozen times. In fact, a uh, a video just surfaced of me playing there in 1983. It's uh, Greg Leon Live Roxy in 1983. I think I saw it a little yeah. bit. Of it. I don't know where it came from. It just got put up there. And uh, I watched it the other night. But, man, this was before anybody was doing this stuff. And I had this good band. And we're playing. And uh, anyways, the Roxy was a whole different class. They were totally professional. It was upscale. Mostly the bands that played there, most of them were signed bands, record deals on the charts, you know, or if a label was interested in it and booked it into there so they could see them live. Uh, it was very hard to get in there until we played there. Once we played there and they heard us, yeah. they would have us come back and open up for like major acts that were coming through and stuff. Right. And uh, I always loved playing the Roxy. It was, it was just great. I, I remember one time we did the Roxy and it was probably about 83, uh, about the same time that video, it might've even been that night, that video surface. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's his name? Um, Joe Perry from Aerosmith showed up mm-hmm. and he's up in our dressing room. And, you know, he, he, he had heard about us through the drummer and the drummer, Carlos at the time, Carl James, Carl Elizondo, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, the, he was putting a solo band together and he goes, man, my band would be great to back up your thing. And so he was there to check us out. We're hanging out upstairs in our dressing room. And we're all jazz because we're all, you know, pretty much Aerosmith fans. Sure. Apparently he did some heroin and we go out on stage and he sat down and passed out. Never saw one note of it. I was so mad at the I kicked him out of my dressing room. And I went up and get the <laughs> fuck out of here, fucking asshole. Who the hell comes to a concert and gets <laughs> heroin and passes out? I mean, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. You know, why would you? How much fun did you have tonight, buddy? You know, he's sitting there all nodding out and stuff. I was like, how stupid is that? So tell, that let, me ask, a, let me ask you about the guitar players like yourself at the time. You know, you had this is I don't, you know, this is what I heard. And, and so you had Randy, Eddie. George. Yeah. And who else? Yourself and who else was like me? You had Carlos, Carlos Cavazo. Yeah. Uh, there was a guy in a band called a la carte. Kevin Kreese, I think is his name. And he's still playing. What about the guy who plays um, Mark McCartney? Uh, and th- there was Rusty Anderson, who's a good right. friend of mine. Nice Rusty. guy. Nice guy. Um, he was always one of the better guitar players because he really knew the theory behind it. He knew millions of chords. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he he really knew his stuff and he was doing sessions even back then for people. Um, who the heck else was it? Um, yeah. uh, we had a good time back then and it was so fun and everybody was into just having a good time and following bands. And I mean, it was a dream come true. You right. know, right. You, you went and people love going out. Nowadays, nobody even wants to go out. I know. You, it's so different, right? you know, we used to. You know, oh, God. We used to sell out everywhere, but now we're older too. You know, our old fans, they all got kids or grandkids and you can't expect them to be going out and putting themselves through that. And yeah, I know. Dragging their ass the next I know, day. man. It's <laughs> exactly the same here. Let me ask you about uh, one, some of the Randy stuff. One of the things that you said in another interview is that you I went. I never with, said that. I never said I that. Know. This is about the guitar, about this guitar right here. The Randy. Yeah. The original Concord. Yeah. I hung out with Grover Jackson for one night in his shop oh, 10 years ago. Did you so wear he, protection? Did you wear protection? <laughs> I probably no. He told me every story there was, though. Yeah. <laughs> and then what? I know the one he didn't tell you. Which one was I, that's the one where I drove Randy to Charvel out in San Dimas. He did, that, he did, he did say it. he did say it was around Christmas time. Yeah. Well, Randy and I drove, I had just gotten the gig with his band. I mean, with the Quiet Riot before we changed the name to Dubrow. And Randy knew that I had an endorsement deal and I was really good friends with Grover. 
And he asked me, do you think that he would, I go, dude, all I got to do is call him. He'll do that. No problem. So I called Grover. He says, yeah, come on out, bring him. So went out there with, I had my little 67 MGB GT. We jumped in there. He had a, a, a roll of uh, ta- um, paper, brown paper that was rolled up uh, with a couple of rubber bands around it. And he had, he had traced a flying V and we get out there and uh, we put it, uh, what do you call it? Grover cleared his desk off and uh, he got some, uh, uh, there were cans that were like pencil holders and you know, like paperweights and stuff. So it wouldn't roll back up. He went and, on the four corners of it and made it yeah. stay straight. And we're looking at it and I go, Randy, it's just a flying V. Right. He had traced a flying V and Grover goes, well, yeah, why would we do that? And so Grover being smart, he reached behind his desk. He had a yardstick. And from the neck where the neck meets the body, he started, you know, going like this and, and uh, penciling in real light, different lines. Well, what do you think of that? Well, what about this back angle? Let's not make it even. Don't make it like a V. Make it, you know, like it's off center or something. Like you took an X, I mean, a, a box and shoved it up into it. And you could adjust how that angle coming off of that was. Right. So we sat there for five or 10 minutes and, uh, so this, this this guitar is the actual. This is the original shape of the yeah, original that's version. Right. That's it's right. The, it's the bigger. Yeah. The, you know, yeah. the other one's a lot more sharky. Yeah. Yeah, that's the original. And so then we came up with that, and Randy, you know, kind of signed off on. Okay, well, let's try that. And uh, that was the first neck through that they made. Yeah. And, uh, right. Because right. all the other ones were bolt on necks, but he wanted to do some glue in necks, you know, set necks as they call them, and so. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, I bring Randy back after he's got a mock up of it and Randy liked it and they went ahead with it. And then after that, they were on their own. But I took them out there for those first two uh, first two uh, meetings with Grover. So that was the big, the big white one with the, uh, the, the we call with the, the one you see on all the Aussie early Aussie photos. Yeah, we uh, uh, he had given me uh, so many guitars. Him and his ex-wife, Joanne, were just wonderful to me. They're taking me out to dinner. They're showing up at my gigs and just setting guitars on the stage for me. Hey, this is your new guitar. We, we thought about you. We want you to have it. And they would go to dinner and they'd be back for the show. And I mean, Grover was wonderful. And Joanne, just wonderful people. And I would go out there and uh, I met Grover. This is a funny thing. I, you know, I was a big Van Halen fan, too. And uh, I knew about Charvel. I didn't know where the hell they were. I didn't even know what San Dimas was until I met uh, Tommy Lee. And Tommy Lee was playing. It was Tommy Bass then, Tom Bass. Okay. But he joined Sweet 19 after Gary left. He'd been following me for a long time. But his uncle in San D, he was in West Covina, but his uncle had a paint shop that was right next door to uh, Char- uh, Charvel. Okay. And uh, I brought that up and he goes, hey, my uncle's right next door to there in the, in the uh, business complex, uh, industrial complex that they had. So we take a drive, meet his uncle. His uncle walks me over and introduces me to Grover. And yeah, this is my, you know, my, my nephews or whatever, Tom and this is his guitar player and so he came and checked us out and I bought a guitar body from him and I had a Telecaster neck that I had from one of my old drummer's girlfriends a Telecaster like a 72 or something like that and I put that neck originally on the body that I bought from Grover and I had Tommy Lee's uncle paint it the brightest yellow you've ever seen in your life it was pure yellow paint I said I don't want anything mixed with this and this thing, if you had all the lights off in the room, it still glowed. So right. wherever you were, you could see that guitar. And I didn't want to do stripes because that was Eddie's thing. But right. I wanted something that just caught your eye and it was blinding. And this guitar was. People still talk about it to this day. And I used that for a long time. One pickup in it, one volume control, uh, Telecaster neck, a real Fender Telecaster neck, tremolo arm. And then that got ruined coming back from Germany with uh, Dokken. Okay. They threw it up on the ramp and it missed the ramp and landed face down. The controls went right through the wood. So I went and did a claim on it and I got 640 bucks, which is the maximum they would pay you for something like that. I had probably 50 bucks in the guitar. And so <laughs> but I took that neck off and I bought a second neck from Grover for 25 bucks. And I just put it on there when I handed the guitar back in uh-huh. and I took the good pickups out of there. And I mean, it looked like it was the right thing, but it wasn't. So I took that $640 and I bought $640 worth of used, I mean, uh, seconds, guitar bodies and necks off of Grover. Okay. Okay. And I took, put them in the recycler, which is a local paper. I don't know if they have those where, where everybody else is, yeah. but it was yeah. A paper. yeah. And so I sold those for $50 to $100 a piece. 
you know, I could triple my money easily. So I went back. Now I got like 2000 bucks. I bought $2,000 worth of necks and bodies at 50 bucks a piece. My whole MGB GT was filled up floor to ceiling with guitar bodies and necks. Some of the necks, you know, I'd sand them down and make them good. Some of them were painted, but they had a little flaw in it. So they would they were seconds. They wouldn't use them. Mm-hmm. Took those. I came back with like five grand the next time. And this is like 1970, I don't know, nine, 1979 or 80 or something like that. And everybody in the recycler was coming to me for Charvel guitars, but he would never give me the, uh, the decal for him. That okay. was the thing. He goes, I can't give you the decal. I go, that's fine. They're moving. He goes, I'm glad I don't have to grind them up. He goes, I, he was glad to get a little money for go take his wife to dinner or buy everybody lunch all the time or whatever. So I come back the last time. And he goes, Greg, I, I can't do this anymore. I go, what are you talking about? I got the money here. He goes, no, I can't do this anymore. Guitar Center called me and said, there's some guy in, uh, in around Glendale that's selling these bodies out his, out his back door of his house or whatever, and he's killing our business. People, why would I give you that much money when I can get a body and a neck, you know, off Greg for, or this guy, for, they wouldn't say my name, for 200 bucks. And <laughs> another 100 bucks, I got me a bitch and Charvel guitar. So it's a lot of those people still have those guitars. And I made some long-lasting friends about it. So he had to get a wood chipper. And when they had seconds, they had to put him in the wood chipper. So that ended that. But he still gave me guitars. And or, you know, if he had one there that I really liked, a lot of times he'd go, just take it home. It's yours. Take it home. You're going to use it. Just go see. So before I left for Europe on tour with Dokken, him and us were playing the, the whiskey. And uh, Grover shows, I think I'm pretty sure it was the whiskey. I don't think it was the Starwood because it was a high stage. I remember him setting guitars up on the stage. He's a big guy. He's yeah. not a little tiny guy. Yep. And uh, so he's setting guitars up on the stage. And I don't know, it was six to 12 guitars. And he knew I was going to, and he made Don a custom guitar too. And Don accidentally broke the headstock off at a, an Explorer, one of the first Explorer's neck throughs. And, I would, and he loaned it to, to, to a Don though. He didn't give it to him. He loaned it to him. And when Don brought it back, the headstock was busted off and Don didn't see it. And I get the phone. What the fuck happened to this guitar? I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, don't know. I, you know I just delivered the stuff. Don gave it to me to give to you. So anyway, so Don, uh, Grover g- gives me all these guitars. And he goes, this is what I, I'll give you these, but this is what I want you to do. Take them over to Europe with you. Get seen playing them because you couldn't get Charvels over there. But everybody was seeing this, the Charvel headstock on the on the Van Halen cover. What, what are these Charvel things, you know? So right. I went over there and people are like freaking out that hey, this guy's got those Charvel guitars. So he said, buy them, sell them, bust them on stage, but get seen with them. You know, and it, whatever you do, just get seen with them. So I met this guy that had, I can't remember his name. It wasn't Dieter or I, I can't remember what his name is, but he had a really big uh, music store, a bunch of music stores that were like huge in Europe. And he, we hit it off and he asked him all these questions. Well, I hooked him up with Grover and Grover and him set up the biggest export deal of guitars, like a multi-million dollar deal. Mm. And if I'd been more Jewish, and I mean that in a good way, I would have gotten in the middle of that somehow, but I didn't because he was my friend. He's giving me guitars. I helped my buddy out, you know, right, right. And it turned out really good for him. Really good. But he'd given me so much and, you know, it makes you when you're a kid coming up and people are, you know, realizing your t- potential, and your talent, and they're giving you guitars, they're, they're, you know, turning you on to people that can help you and get your sound better and, you know, giving you amplifiers and stuff like that. I mean, it's like, wow, this is maybe I am that good. Maybe I should, you know, and maybe it isn't just a pipe dream to become a professional magician, a musician. <laughs> you <go>. magician. <laughs> magician. <laughs> you know, most magic tricks are easy once you know the secrets. So, Let me ask you about uh, about a, a little bit about you know like you said you were you were influenced by like you know the the earlier uh, British invasion type stuff. Which guitar you said Blackmore? I love Blackmore. I love Tony Iommi. I, I don't think any self respecting guitar player can say they don't like Tony Iommi or, or Richie Blackmore. Did you like you know, Hendrix? Hendrix was who? Jeff Beck. I love Jeff Beck. I've met Jeff Beck a couple of times. He went crazy over my wife, which just it was so funny to me. <laughs> uh, we saw him at the, uh, at the, uh, um, oh God, what do you call that place here? The Greek theater. And we're backstage. A really good buddy of mine was one of the head guys of them. He always get us backstage and free tickets. So we're backstage and we're talking with Tony Basil and my wife and I, and all of a sudden Jeff comes up and he stands right next to me. And he had all kinds of amp problems on stage that night. So oh, I go, dude, you sure could have used me a little while. He goes, what do you mean, mate? 
And I went to my pocket and I pulled out my business card and he went like this with his hands up in the air. Where were you? I go, dude, if I would have jumped up on the stage, they would have tackled me and killed me. And <laughs> so, anyway, so we laughed a little bit and he didn't know it was my wife because my wife was standing next to Tony Basil and we're, I'm facing them and he's next to me. And he goes up to my wife and he's like grabbing her face, you know, and she's very well, uh, beautiful, beautiful girl, very well endowed. I think that's what you call it. Uh, she's built. Let's just say she's built. And he's like, just you know, like, oh, my God, you're beautiful. I go, uh, excuse me. And I'm hitting him. I go, it's my fucking wife, Jeff. And he goes, why? She's beautiful, man. I'm hitting her home. You know? you know, so like, that's, that's cool. And my wife's just like, wow, I still got it. You know, we're, we're getting older now, you know. And and uh, but it was fun. And he was really cool. He played his ass off that night. It was like, well, and I ran into uh, Tim Bogart and Jeff Beck that night. I mean, Tim Bogart and Carmine Apathy. And I know Jeff. Uh, I know Tim, I know Jeff too, but I know, um, not Jeff, I know Tim Bogart because I did a bunch of sessions with him where this producer would call us in. And it was a, a core that was the rhythm. And it was me, uh, Tom, Tim Bogart, and a guy named um, uh, Kevin Valentine on drums. Mm -hmm. And so I walk up to him, we're talking, like, hey, what's it going to take to get Beg Bogart and Apathy back together? And they both at the same time sent a phone call. And so <laughs> I just started cracking up because it was like in unison. That question had been asked him before, I think. But uh, yeah, Jeff, but Beck Bogart and Apathy to me is is the best Bogart, uh, the best, uh, the best uh, Jeff Beck to me because the songs are really great. They're memorable. It's not just a bunch of noodling. They're actually songs that are worked out. Right, right, right. Uh, so you started out, you know, I guess how, what age? You said eight. No, no, no. I was a drummer from the time I was about nine or ten. Okay. And uh, I had a, a what do you call it? A paper route, and I bought a used uh, Ludwig kit. Okay. Uh, Mo White Mother Pearl that I loved. And I was in bands in junior high school playing uh, drums, but I also picked up guitar when I was about 12. Yeah. And uh, I've been playing around with that. And uh, in junior high, I was playing drums in one band and guitar in another. And uh, we did a, a, a talent contest at my uh, Roosevelt Junior High School in Glendale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had about 3,000 people in the whole school. And uh, maybe not quite that, maybe maybe 2000 and the, they split it in half of the talent show, one half of the school for, you know, the first talent show and the second one was it's the same talent show, but just, you know, a couple hours later in the day. And we went up there and we played, uh, Vood I played Voodoo Child, Slight Return. I did uh, um, Jumpin' Jack Flash or Johnny Be Good, Johnny Winter style and Inside Looking Out, a drug song by, by Grand Funk Railroad. We did these three songs and the, the kids in the audience went crazy. So we did the second one. All of the people from the first one, most of them showed up for the second one. They cut, cut class and it was just people standing. I mean, just like everywhere was people. And from that point on in junior high school, and that was probably eighth grade, um, every, uh, just about every weekend or at least a couple of weekends a month, somebody would have a party and want us to play. Yeah, and when it yeah. went into high school, it was every weekend and there was a club in Glendale called the Copa and we used to play there underage. And as soon as we get finished playing, they would take us out the back door because we couldn't be in there, you know, because we were way underage. Right, but, right, you know, right. I'm doing Hendrix and, you know, whatever all of them stuff. But that's when I realized that 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 uh, in, in junior high school at that talent show, maybe I got something here, you know, and, and uh, the, the, everybody was so crazy about it. girls were coming on to me and so I was in junior. I mean, it's a. A little kid, a little boy's dream, you know, and all these <laughs> girls were interested in me. Wow, this is awesome. So we started playing all the time and, and just, uh, you, know, you know, and part of it was you were working towards, you know, stardom and the big time. And, you know, it's all going to lead to something. And everything was going great until Nirvana. Hit. Right, <laughs> and everything, I, the, the brakes got kind of pulled back. And like, I, oh, was there, right? I was there and it hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a yeah, band yeah. doing like a. I would say we we're like lover boy, you know, we yeah, were kind cool. of pop, pop rock. And uh, when that Nirvana hit, man. That's funny. You mentioned a lover boy. Uh, yeah. My wife knew uh, Paul Dean. Yeah. And she's Canadian. And he traced her down. He was following. He thought she thought it was some stalker. And uh, so they, he finally stops her outside of this. Uh, I don't know if it, what it was like. Uh, some I don't know some type of uh, thrifties or something like that, and he kept looking at her through the aisles and stuff. And she was like get, kind of getting freaked out because he was older. And uh, he stops her outside and says, "Hey, do you sing?" And she goes, "Yeah, I'm a singer. I'm Susa, you know." And she had a 
her own band in Canada and toured and she had, she's probably done more shows than I have. Uh, but they were doing top 40, but they would play six nights a week. She was on, on tour on the road for 10 years straight. Okay. Wow. 10 years straight. She only took off for uh, Christmas. So anyways, he meets her, you know, she's a super hot chick. And uh, he's like, once to get her in the band, they were putting Loverboy together. And they had a band together before that. And uh, I can't remember the name of her right now. I'd know it if I heard it, but they never made it here in the States. I don't even think the record got released. But anyways, he had all the connections and stuff. And uh, I guess she called him and his girlfriend or wife picked the phone up. And she, he, I guess after talking with Susan, she, there's no way you're letting her in the band. And uh, <laughs> so this big thing broke up. So she didn't get that, that thing. And uh, but so we wow. went and saw, we went and saw them. Oh, yeah. uh, and my old, one of my old drummers, Mark Jube from Survivor, they were playing with Survivor okay. down South. And we went and we're backstage. And as soon as Sus Susan walked in, my wife and I, Paul D looked at her and goes, Susan, hadn't seen her in 30 years. Susan, is that you? And, you know, so they were talking and laughing. He's still apologizing. And we're just laughing. It doesn't even matter, you know. But, but uh, they, were great. they were great. Uh, you know, the singer, uh, I can't think of his name. Mike Reno was great. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole band is still great. Yeah. The weirdest yeah. mic technique I've ever seen. You know, when he hits the high notes, he goes up like that. And, but yeah. Survivor was great, you know. And uh, well, how Mark, long ago was that that you're talking about? Oh, God. It's got to be 15 years now. Yeah, they put an album, an album, out, an album out about 10 years ago. It was really good. Who, which one? It was uh, Just Getting Started. Oh, you mean uh, uh, Lover Boy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they put it on an album, and it was just as good as anything they'd ever done. I just never got any, you know, Harley yeah. traction. Because, you know, at the time, it's just, it just nowadays, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah, but, nobody but cares it, anymore. Oh, there was another guitar player, but he... Danny Johnson. I don't. You might even know who Danny Johnson is. He was in Axis, and he was with Rick Derringer. Okay. Uh, in the Derringer band, amazing guitar player, super nice guy from Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, we befriended him, and we ended up getting a rehearsal to get, uh, rehearsal space together in uh, North Hollywood. We yeah. had it for about I don't know a year and a half or whatever. I watched. I stole every lick from that guy. The guy was yeah. like, it was like a, a class. I mean, like a con uh, a college advanced course in guitar playing and the vibrato, the whole thing. And I mean, I've always been known for my vibrato, but this guy just had it in spades. He was so cool mm -hmm. and uh, just didn't rush nothing. It's that Southern thing where you just, you make every note count and stuff, you know, and I, I just really love Danny. I still do to this day. Mm -hmm. And that band Axis did one record with Vinnie Apice on drums and Jay Davis on bass. Still one of my favorite uh, records to this day. Yeah, I was gonna say Lynch. Lynch has a very unique vibrato too. He's always had that. Well, yeah, he does that thing like this. Yeah, it's that weird thing. Much, yeah, right. It's right. not too much wrist vibrato. It's <laughs> that wild, wild. Yeah, yeah. He does that crazy thing, man. So yeah. when, uh, like those guys, when you discovered Van Halen, and then you knew Randy before this, right? Yeah, I knew Randy. Well, I met him the night of uh, of uh, the Van Halen Quiet Riot show at Galindo College. But I didn't actually get to hang out with him or really talk to him and find out that he loved the way I played. They used to show up at my parties sometimes, him and Kevin and yeah. Drew. Um, but I didn't know him until the start where we did a, a show with them where we opened up for Quiet Riot for three days. And Randy and I just kind of hit it off. And, uh, you know, he gave me his phone number and we became friends. And I ended up when he went with Ozzy teaching at Musoni, his mother's music school. Yeah. And uh, what a nice guy. I mean, he was just such a genuinely warm person and uh just just a nice guy i mean just never if he had anything bad to say about somebody it was in jest and he had a joke coming along with it so uh he was just a nice guy and uh and uh i remember my i had a bass player named uh, jack cole in a band i had called fever uh -huh. and uh, he wanted a custom bass and i said dude i know the guy so right. we went out there and he designed a bass that was pink with black tiger stripes on it. And it was a bass neck through amazing, amazing bass gave me such a great deal on it. And, uh, you know, there were normally back then like 1200 bucks. I think he let me have it for five or 600 bucks with a case. I mean, everything cause it had a tremolo arm on it too. Oh, wow. who, who the hell had a Kaler on a bass back then? Right. And, right. uh, I got a bunch of pictures of, uh, us on stage with that guitar, that bass. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Grover, Grover, you know, me, me and Grover sat down and I, I asked him every question about every player that he ever worked with, you know, everybody from uh, 
from Eddie all the way through Neil Sean and Brandy Brandy Rose and everybody that had you know dealt with. I think he said he was telling me. I think it was a guitar player played his. Uh, it was maybe it was Michael Jackson's guitar player played his played his Charvel on stage and his parents. Girl? Finally, huh? The girl, the girl or the guy? I think this was. I'm not sure. This was. His parents, you know, his parents were kind of like against him going out there and all that. And when they finally saw his guitar on TV, maybe it was Jeff Beck. I can't remember, but it was on TV. <laughs> maybe it was Jeff Beck. I can't remember. I can't remember. But anyway, he was talking about his parents finally seeing something on an award show. And it was his guitar, right? Yeah. And and his parents finally kind of got, well, he finally made it. He finally did something, you know. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. had some great stories, man, and all you guys wow. out there, and and that that those whole that whole thing, like you were talking about with the bodies and stuff, it was like crazy. Like, was everybody doing that or what? No, I was doing. It. <laughs> you were, you were, I, nobody had any money back then. We none of us. We're all my. I grew up in a really poor family. I had two sisters, Debbie and Nancy, a mom and a dad. Nothing but love in the house and nothing but music. My dad was a musician, not professional. But uh, he was a piano player, a harmonica player, but he was an amazing singer. And my dad's Italian. He just had that thing. He was like a mix between uh, a really good looking guy, but he ha vocally was like a mix, if, if you can imagine this, between Elvis Presley and Frank Sinatra. Mm. He could croon, do the crooning songs and he, could, he was just great and a great memory for lyrics and stuff. But, uh, oh God, I forgot where I was going with that, but... Uh, Talking yeah, we grew up with no money. Nobody had any money back then, you know. So I come in with 640 bucks for some necks that are and bodies that are sitting in a pile there that he doesn't even know what to do with. And I come in there and, and then I come back in, you know, with 1800 bucks or you got whatever it was, you know, and triple the money and just took it all out there and then did it again. I don't know anybody that was doing that but me back then. As yeah, far so as like with like Lynch talked about getting the body and all these guys talked about getting the body. Were you like supplying all these bodies to all these people? <laughs> I never sold a body to uh, to George, um, but they were but everybody, everybody was into to like build after Eddie. I don't know if it was all all yeah. after Eddie because the Charvel thing what was like seventy nine, yeah seventy eight right after Eddie yeah. and it kind of took off right then. Yeah, so most guys would buy one body and do something with it. I was buying twenty of them, right? <laughs> and, uh, and selling and selling them most of them though. I sold all of them and uh, I'd have him make me guitars. I'd want, you know, a certain configuration or a certain color, whatever. And I just, I loved the guitar, but I just couldn't get into the necks. They were too wide and flat and they just didn't let me be, you know, what a strat, a real strat, or especially what a Les Paul would allow me to do. Right. And I always tell, in fact, he'll probably remember this, but I remember we were out there and uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember what I was doing out there. It might have been uh, Don Dawkin with me or something. But anyways, he had – and I kept telling uh, Grover, I go, Grover, why don't you make a Stratocaster body but with a Gibson scale neck on it? You know, for people that don't have huge hands. And also, why don't you put a 20-second fret on there? You always have 21 like Fender. I go, look at that neck right there. You got, And before they shave off the uh, where the butt of it is, the fretboard hangs over the thing. I go, you got plenty of room right there for another uh, fret. You could probably put two on there. And he picked up the neck goes, man, that's a good idea, man. I'm going to stop everything. So they stopped everything and they started putting that extra fret in there. So now they had 22 frets on a strat neck. Well, that was my idea that he took. Wow. And uh, he confirmed that when I saw him out at the NAMM show, because I've been telling my friends that was my idea. And there was, there's been quite a few ideas. Like I was really good friends with Aspen Pittman. Yeah. And uh, he was a genius and a marketing guru. I mean, just amazing. He could sell anything. Mm -hmm. But I remember, and he, he was a big supporter of mine too. And I ended up being his amp tech for the last, I don't know, 15 years before he died or whatever. But I remember years ago, we were out at the, uh, the factory and we're hanging out in his office, just shooting the shit. And I go, I got an idea, but I don't know how to do it. He, I go, you could take uh, like a, a T thing where you take, you plug it into the tube socket. You've already got all the voltage you need, split it up instead of adding another tube and drilling another hole, just have two tubes mounted on it with one, you know, nine pin mini socket going into the tube socket and just voice it the way you, the, you know, however you want, you can get as much gain or whatever. You can put a volume control on it. And that way it would be, and he goes, man, that is a great idea. 
why he tried to do but he couldn't do it. But I think he got somebody else to do it and they started marketing it, but they didn't market it right. And I think George Lynch now through. Uh, yeah, I know uh, you're talking about. Yeah, he has a he has that. the It's like an add on to uh, you just plug it in and it's it, you got another extra tube in the game. But that was originally my idea that I came up with, but I didn't know how to do it. I just knew it could be done. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, I miss Aspen. I miss him so much. Yeah, I met, I met him years ago. You know, one of one of the the lore of one of his heads, and you'd know this head probably if you knew if you're really close with Aspen, was the purple marshal he had. Yeah, had an old seventy or sixties, I think. That yeah, George sixty eight or sixty nine. George yeah. used one of the. Uh, Apparently, George uh, wanted to steal it forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, you get a marshal head that's just got that magic, like that one Collins got that white one. Yeah, he brought it over to my house the other day. I put a master volume in it for him, a real master volume. Right. But he brought it over to the house the other with a, a cabinet he had just bought and plugged in with his thing. And we set it up in my patio and he plugged it in and it was Van Halen. I mean, it was that sound. Wow. It, was, it sounded so wonderful. I couldn't believe it. And he's th that kid's amazing. I mean, he is like so into it. I, you know, I, I, he told me you know, he didn't tell me he was 18 for a while. Yeah. Then he yeah, goes, he, I'm 18. I'm like, you're 18. He goes, Van, Van Halen's my life. I was like. Yeah. All right, man. <laughs> yeah. He brings stuff to me all the time to fix and go through and make straight. But he finds the rarest stuff. And this kid, I don't know how he, man, if I had that kind of drive and that money behind me when I was a kid, but he did it all himself. His parents don't give it to him. He wheeled and dealed and bought and sold and traded. And, and he's got, you know, he knows what he wants. He does all of the homework on it. And he just gets the best stuff and the rarest. I bought heads off him for myself. I still have. Stuff that you you can't even find locally. He'll yeah, he'll fly him in from from Europe wow, if he yeah. finds it. He'll, he's amazing. Finding those old marshals like that—that's a that's an amazing head. I mean, it, it's, I love that. Yeah, yeah. It's it, you know he and I are talking about way, a way to get that out there and let somebody let people hear that. You know, Pete Thorne is a a big YouTuber and uh, yeah, big know, time. But you know, Pete. But but I think Pete and him are going to try to do something together. Cool with that head. Yeah, that'd be a really cool story to see and see the uh, the lineage yeah, totally. of, of that. Totally, yeah, totally stock except for the master volume I put in it. It yeah. sounds like God. Sounds yeah. like God. El thirty four. Uh, he's got six CA sevens in it now, but it, yeah, it was the El thirty fours. Yeah, because that's what they use the six CA sevens. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's what I used to. Do you? Yeah, yeah. I just went uh, just went back to Marshall. I've always had Marshall amps. I got uh, five complete stacks and I got nine heads, but I was using uh, PV 5150s and 6505s just because I didn't care if they got hurt on the road and they sounded good enough, you know? So I plugged in my old Marshalls a little while ago and a, a Marshall, JC, of all things, a JCM 900 came into my shop. A guy brought in three amps and he didn't want to pay to get them fixed. He goes, well, how about I just give you one of my amps, pick any one of these amps instead of me giving you money because I'm on vacation, I really need my money in my pocket. And I, I remember how good the JCM 900 sounded. So I go, I'll take the Marshall. I mean, if you want, I mean, I, if I want, he goes, that's fine. So I got that amp and I took it to rehearsal and I played to it and I put my, you know, lexicon through the effects loop. Come man, this is the sound right here. This is exactly the sound of Luber. So I ended up buying two more of them. They one of them came to me through the shop, real real good price. And uh, another one I got, I don't know, I did some deal with somebody with something else. But anyways, got them like almost free, you know. And there, I used them at the the um, record release party at the club. Everybody was just like, dude, your guitar tone's just off the hook. This is crazy. <laughs> you and know what? I, I, I point to the guitar and go, yeah, listen to them. They're really something, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, nothing, to do with, nothing to do with these, you know, or a million years of practice on this stuff. Right. But, you, you know, know what? they do sound great. I, I, you know, I used to work in retail. That's how I ended up going to all the NAMM shows over the years. And uh, I did a deal with somebody at, a sh at the store for $150 for my Marshall, 77 Marshall. 150 bucks. Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> you know what's in, you know what's in it right now is this was the period in 77 when they brought them over without tubes in them i think and they tubed them in the u.s and they were tubing them 65s. with 65s yeah. yeah so i've got the groove tube 6550s in it yeah it, it freaking kills man yeah yeah i yeah. ended up getting a guy i i've i a friend of mine said hey there's a guitar in the uh Oh uh, God, I can't remember that. It wasn't the recital. It was like Green Sheet or the local, some local nonsense paper. But a friend of mine called me up with a phone. He goes, call this guy. He's got a marshal. He's right down the street from you. 
So I call him up. It's 1500 bucks. I get to his house. It's been in his garage for like 20 years, rolled up in a, uh, in a, um, a bedspread. He had it rolled up in a bedspread and folded over. And so we unroll it and instantly blowing fuse. As soon as you plug it in, hmm. instantly blowing fuse. 74 Marshall had really great condition. 1500 bucks. I got him down to 350 bucks. Gave him the 350 bucks. I brought it home and had a broken output tube. That was it. I pulled that tube out, put another 6550 in there, turned it on. It sounded amazing. Then I took those tubes out, put some six CA7s and rebiased it. Unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. But yeah, those deals are getting harder to get and harder and harder to get because the marshals are going for, you know, two to $3,500 now. Yeah. For, it's ridiculous. So, so what do you think of like Dave Friedman's amps and, and those? Amazing. Guys? Yeah, Amazing. I've, got, I've got a small box. Amazing. And um, I get them in the shop every once in a while. Somebody will bring one in for me to buy us or, you know, just check the tubes or whatever. Just do a general service. There's never anything really wrong with them. Mm-hmm. None of the ones I've seen. And every time I turn them on and start playing, I don't want to give it back to the guy. They sound amazing. Straight in. Just wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are voiced just what a guitar player like I want to hear. Right. And, and obviously you too, you've got these guitars behind you and stuff. And, oh yeah, man. I've got, you know, too much. I, I know what you like, <laughs> you know, that's what I, that's what I see. Secret, what you're into. I take, well, I'm in, I got a, you know, a crap load of guitars and, yeah, and, and, uh, you know, I've got, I, I kind of started out on Explorer when I was, for, when I was a kid. And, uh, so Gibson I've got or a, Ibanez? Gibson or Ibanez? Uh, Gibson. I had an 84, uh, Gibson when they did the designer series, that was my first oh, yeah. guitar or my first real Gibson. And then, you know, I've got, of course, I've got a Les Paul. I got a Flying V from the '83. You know, the Heritage Vs. Yeah, got a natural one of those, which is one that got to be the best sounding guitar I have with the Carino with the uh, PAS. Are you are you hip yet, uh, Jeff, to uh, um, uh, um, Pearly Gates pickups by uh, Seymour Duncan? Yeah, you know, I, I forever I used uh, the JB for a long time, but I've never uh-huh. used Pearly, Ga- Pearly Gates. Do yourself a huge favor. Yeah. One of my customers. He had me install a, a set of those in his Les Paul, and it was like the best sounding guitar I'd ever heard at that point. And I was raving over it. What well, last week he comes, he calls me up because, "Hey, I'm in your neighborhood. Can I come by and drop something off?" I thought, figured he had another Marshall or something like that for me to work on. Mm-hmm. Comes in, he hands me a, a package. He bought me a, a match set of those. Oh wow! And uh, just gave them to me. Well, I put them in my main Les Paul in 1970. Uh, Red, it's a cardinal red finish, a custom order. They only made three that year. Wow. And um, I put them in that, which already sounded amazing. I had uh, high order pickups in there and a, and a T top in the front. Amazing. Amazing. So, anyways, I swap it out and I sat there for hours looking. God, do I want to change this? It already sounds so perfect. And then I go, well, shit, I can change them back if I don't like it. I put them in there. And as soon as I heard, hit the first chord, it was like, oh my God, this is the most even, most perfectly balanced sounding. I can't believe it sounds as good. So that's why I'm telling people, if you if you think you got a good sounding guitar now, get a pair of Pearly Gates. They're expensive. Didn't cost me nothing, but they're expensive. But I'm going to get them for my SG and a couple of more of my Les Pauls. Absolutely fantastic. The most perfect sounding pickup I've ever heard. Yeah, I've heard them for years. You know, heard about it yeah. for years. Yeah. But you never see them. That's the problem. You never see them. Yeah. yeah that's people wild. talk about them. And they are amazing. That's wild. One thing I probably want to cover with you before we get out of here is – your career in amp repair. How did that well, start? That well, how did you get from? I grew up really poor. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in Glendale, California. My dad was a barber, so the Beatles come in in '64. I'm born in '58. He used to make a pretty good living before the Beatles came. And then after that, all these people were growing their hair out, and all the kids, no kid wanted it. I didn't want a haircut. Hell, I used to run away from home and my dad said, all right, summertime, we're getting sh- going to give you a butch. I used to get a butch every right as soon as school let out. And so uh, anyway, so, you know, money went down. My dad and my mom had three kids, like I mentioned earlier. And uh, I don't think he ever made more than $100 in a whole week growing up. I mean, it was tough. Mm-hmm. And we had a house in Glendale and the uh, the rent was $300, $305 a month. And he struggled to make that every month. It was yeah. terrible. But. There was so much love and joy in our family. And he just loved having kids and took us everywhere. I was just talking to my sister about this the other night. Took us everywhere. He was never too busy to do what we wanted and to help us out or if I needed. So so anyways, what happened was I had this Wawa pedal and I had shit guitars and whatever I could find or trade, you know, those people. I had this, this Wawa pedal called a Cromwell 
Japanese thing with the surf and the siren and the volume pedal and the wah and there you could switch it and it four switches. And all of a sudden it quit working and I was all bummed out. And so I took it up with my dad to the uh, Charles Music in Glendale and gave it to the repair guy in there. And I'm like 12 years old at the time, 13 maybe. And the guy goes, I'll fix And Oh, and I had taken the resistors out and just put a bunch of different resistors in there thinking it would fix it. Mess the whole thing up even worse, you know. So the guy goes, I'll fix it, but don't call me. I'll do it on my downtime. So the guy get a call about a month later. All right, Greg, your wah was done. I go, how much is it? And he goes, $10. Oh, my God. How am I going to tell my dad I need $10? So my dad takes, drives me down to Charles Music, and we're there, and the guy's there. My dad gives him the $10, and the guy turns around, and uh, my dad goes, you better learn how to fix this stuff because I can't, money doesn't grow on, I never forget, money doesn't grow on trees. And so school was getting ready to start. And my dad goes, why don't you take electricity and electronics and just learn about this stuff? It's like, man, that's a good idea. Cause I always like tinkering with stuff and taking things apart. So I started in junior high school in electricity class. And you make motors, you take things apart and yeah. they teach you Ohm's law, this, that, and the other. And, and uh, you know, so I took that. And then when I got to high school, I took television repair and electronics. And I, the first year I only got two classes, but I got most of my other classes out of the way within a semester and a half or whatever it was. And so the last year of, of high school, the only thing that I did was electronics. Okay. And, I, and my middle year, I did electronics and auto repair, auto mechanics, which I love mechanics anyways in cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I learned how to do all that stuff. And there was a guy, his name was Spider. I don't know what his real name was. But he and I was always fixing stuff at school for the kids, you know, the, the other guitar players. I'd fix the stuff and I get a grade on it. So it was great for me. I, you know, the teacher wanted us to bring stuff in, fix it, and he would grade us on it. Hmm. And then uh, I used to, I was just telling my wife this the other night, and she just laughed her ass off. Uh, I used to go around on my bicycle before I had a car the day before trash day, running up and down the alleys in Glendale, looking at the trash and to see if anybody's throwing radios away. Or, or something I could fix at school. You know, a TV, I'd get a TV home or have my dad go pick it up for me. And I had a bunch of, always had money in my pocket, you know, because I would fix this stuff. And then and they had a, uh, a board in the office where you could sell stuff. You could post stuff for sale. And I would be selling these radios and TVs and uh, whatever I could fix. You know, I put it in there and it didn't cost me nothing because they supply you the parts at school and I would uh, sell it. So my dad thought I was selling drugs. <laughs> I, I go, no, dad, I go, what do you think I'm doing Sunday nights when I take the bike out? He goes, you did this from, I go, yeah, I did get a grade in school and this and the other. And so from that point on, until I got my own car, he would take me around and we had a, VW, a 67 VW camper and he would take me around and I could get stuff and fix it. Now this way I could go out farther and I was making more money than him just fixing stuff. And a lot of times it was just a solder connection or something. It wasn't, you know, reinventing the wheel or anything. And, that's how I got into fixing things. And in school, you know, the other guitar players would come to me. Hey, do you know how to fix that? And well, let me take a look at it. I can probably figure it out. And then I come up with a Wawa mod and every kid in my school that played guitar wanted that mod. And uh, it's just a 470 res ohm resistor changing it to 220 or, you know, 270 or whatever, you, whatever you like. Mm -hmm. And it just opens it up more. It goes higher and it goes lower. So it's more active. Right. Anyway. So anyways, uh, that's how that started. And then I worked for an electronic company. I worked for this guy, Spider, at a TV repair shop. And uh, it was right near my house. So on the way home, I would stop in there, work four or five hours and, you know, get home before my folks and dinner and stuff. And uh, I just was fixing all the stuff. Then I got a job at a place called Jabco with this guy, Jerry Blaha in Hollywood. And he had a whole, literally a wall of stacked up amps he couldn't fix. And uh, he brought me in. And he goes, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to pay you by the hour because I don't know how good you are, but I'll pay you 50 percent of the labor. You know, and I don't remember what the labor was back then. This was I don't even know what year it was, 70, no, 80 something, 81, 82, 83, something like that. So I went in there. He had a bench for me. I fixed all of that stuff in two days. He owed me nine hundred dollars. <laughs> he was sweating. He was hands were shaking. He's counting the money. And my dad's in the car. My dad thought he was going to try to pull something. And my dad was, you know, <laughs> my dad's dad was mafia. My dad didn't take no shit off nobody. He was a world champion fighter and, you know, Golden Gloves champ. And he, nobody was going to hurt his kids, you know. So he drove me out there to get that money. And the guy's hands are shaking. He's counting out. 
And man, I just can't justify this. I go, what? Paying anybody $900 for two days work. And that was huge <laughs> money back then. Right. And so I go, dude, yeah, but you made $900. You didn't have to do anything. You just let me fix this stuff for you. Right. You made the profit on the parts and stuff. And I go, I don't know why you have a problem. He goes, well, I'm going to have to let you go. I go, dude, I fixed all your stuff. Now you're letting me go. It's ridiculous. So anyways, he gives me the 900 bucks. He goes, I'll find you another job. And he did. He found me another electronics job at a medic at a, uh, a strobe gear for a company called bell car. Anyways, long story. And I'm on the side fixing stuff. And then a building came up in Hollywood and my dad goes, you know what? You're only young once. Just go for it. It's a good deal. Just get it. They don't want first and last. They just want you to move in. So I had this place on Vine and Melrose, a perfect part of town. Uh It was about 60 by 100, the size of the room. It was a huge room. And I set up shop there and I was already fixing stuff for the guitar stores in town. So all of a sudden I got business and I still was doing the bell car stuff. I'm doing Playboy, Penthouse. All of the great photographers, all of them used bell car equipment. So I instantly, as soon as I opened my doors, I had this business. And uh, it was pretty, pretty magical and pretty amazing time. And then as time went on, 20 years later, they went 2,200 bucks a month for the place. And I'm going, you know, I talked to the owner. I go, it's pretty hard for me to justify this to fix another people's amps. And at that point, I wasn't doing the strobe gear anymore because uh, um, digital photography came in and ruined that whole business. Right, right. So I was just doing amplifiers, but I'm I'm doing everybody's amps. So I told the owner of the of the uh, building, I said, you know, twenty two hundred bucks is pretty hard to justify. He goes, well, next year this time it's going to be thirty three because I'm going to be raising it up because of Hollywood beautification, which never happened. All they did was rip everybody off. So anyways, I go, I thought for about two minutes, I go, not two seconds. I go, you know what? I'm going to give you my notice right now. I'll be out of here in 31 days. So 30 days, I'll be out of here. I called up a buddy of mine who's got a moving company. Next week, I moved out, moved into my house. I took care of my mom till she passed. I started my business out of here. So best thing I ever did. Right, right. Wow, man. So now I can do people favors. I can help people out. It's not that, man, I got to get 2,200 bucks. And back then, my wife and I were living in Santa Monica, almost on the beach, and that was 1500 to start. We were there 14 years, and then luckily, they got rent control because when we moved out, they raised the rent to 2800 bucks a month there. Yeah, I was going to so, say, uh, you know, I, I had I, one of the times I was in Pasadena, the, the uh, house that Van Halen grew up in his, his childhood, oh, yeah. home, childhood home. It was 3500 I think, their rent, rent. It's still rented, I think. 3500 and that house is only about – It's dump. It's tiny. It's a dump. A dump. I, I hung out with Eddie in the backyard there, 1881 Las Lunas Lane. Yeah. And uh, it was like the house I grew up in. It was just a, you know, an old house and pretty well unkept. I don't know what it looks like now, but when I was there, you know, it was just middle, you know, poor people living there, you know, like my, my family back then and his family back then until they got their deal and he helped his family out. But that's everybody out here was like, that. It was not that many rich people. Let me oh, ask, you, ask you about Pasadena, too, because somebody we, I was talking to somebody the other day about, I think I, when I was talking to Brad Talensky and, and, and Chris Gill, Chris, you know, is a native out there. And he was saying that the area that Roth's family lives in was like the uh, the Bel Air of the time. Yeah. And and then, of course, across town, the, a lot of the immigrants came in. I guess I don't know if it was the cost of living was fair or. Or what? But it, it seems like it was an old part. It was an old part of uh, Pasadena. So it was the lower income because they were older homes, you know, and people were a lot of rental properties and stuff. Unlike where David Roth grew up, where his dad was a doctor. I mean, it's like it is literally like uh, the, uh, you know, Beverly Hills of that area. It really is. I mean, it's beautiful. over. There. I have some friends that live over there. And it's like these are palatial estates. Just yeah. amazing. It's right down the street. Actually, it's only a couple of miles from Eddie's house. It's not that far. No. But the difference in the, you know, for, for Eddie coming over as an immigrant yeah. with nothing, basically, and then yeah. they're over there at Dave's mansion, you know, it's, yeah. it had to be crazy. It had to have been, man. From I remember house. I had a, uh, you know, I grew up and we, here's a funny thing. I didn't know how poor we were because it was all I knew. And the kids that lived around me, it was all the same type of houses. They were nice, but they were old houses. Mm-hmm. neighbors, all of us, we all hung out. All of us families were just barely struggling. We just thought that's how it was. So I get in high school and I start this band and uh, we go to rehearse at the bass player's house and uh, we walk in, you know, I got my little, uh, little uh, bandmaster amp and my Fender Jaguar guitar and a fuzz face and a little 212 cabinet. 
we set up and we go into the house and it's 30 foot high ceilings. It, you know, there's beams across, there's a big, and it's up on a hill in Glendale that overlooks Glendale and they got a huge pool in the backyard. And I looked at him, I go, man, you live here. Yeah. <laughs> But to him, that was normal because that was all he ever knew. And I'm like, I would I never once let them come to my house. Right. Right. I was embarrassed because, you know, God damn, are my folks losers or what? But they weren't. But here's the thing. They had no love in that family because the dad was always working. He was he was the vice president of Getty Oil. He was always on a trip somewhere. And when he got back into town, don't bother your father. He needs his rest. So never got any affection from his dad. Yeah. yeah you know, it's just crazy. And then next door, two doors away from him was the drummer at the time. His dad was the, the number one heart surgeon in Glendale, Dr. Mm-hmm. D'Agostino. Mm-hmm. Go to his place. We rehearsed it there for a while. Same thing, only bigger. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, oh, my God, people actually live like this. It was like going to the, the Beverly Hills, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Beverly Hillbilly's house. You know, right. it was just incredible, incredible. Right. Right. And we'd spend the night there. We'd hang out all night laughing. The mothers would always make us food and They'd either order <laughs> out or make a big thing. And man, my folks, we was lasagna and spaghetti every night, you know, or, or, uh, or uh, hamburger helper or something, you know. So you, you, know? you said you, were, you went over to his house. What, what were you doing over at his house, at Eddie's house? Rehearse- oh, at Eddie's. Oh, the first time, actually, I was only at his house once. But me and my band, uh, after we'd play gigs or go out for the evening, we used to go to this club called The Wood Sound. And uh, I, I knew where he lived because uh, – uh, Chris Holmes had told me where he lived. Mm. So we found out where that was. And we would wait at the end of his of, uh, of the end of his alley at the other end of the block, waiting for this little Peugeot to come in. And we would be there like we drive by and if the car wasn't there, we knew we'd be coming home probably. So we would wait. We just hang out in my 67 VW camper at the end of the of the alley. And we'd wait till. And so this one night we see this little Peugeot come in and it stops right in front of his gate. He gets out. He opens the gate. He goes and I pull out. I go, Eddie, Eddie. And at first he didn't know who the hell we were. He didn't know if he's going to get beat up or what, you know. I go, no, no, we're fans, man. We're big fans, you know. And so he goes, well, come on in. Well, let's talk, you know, whatever. So we went in and we stood in front of him and he had a leather, black leather jacket. It was cold. I remember him sitting there like this and we're talking for about 45 minutes. And I was just, dude, man, I'm going to get sick. I got to go in the house, man. We got a recording session. He goes, I'll tell you what, you guys are cool. If you want to come down to uh, to the recording studio tomorrow, and I think it was Sunset Sound. He goes, we're going to be recording tomorrow. If you want to come in, then we'll be there from like three o'clock on. So me and the guys are on. We're in heaven. We're going to go watch Van Halen record, you know. And they were doing the second record. And so, uh, you know, obviously the next day we're at Sunset Sound. They buzz us in. We're going here to see Van Halen. We're friends with Eddie. We told him we're friends with Eddie. And uh, so they get us in. And then Dave comes out. And he goes, oh, what do you guys want? And we go, well, we're, Eddie said we could come down. He goes, well, we're doing vocals. I go, yeah, Eddie said we could come down and sit in, if we, you know, not sit in, but listen. He goes, well, I'm doing vocals and uh, I'm saying you can't come in. <laughs> so Ed, he's basically telling us to get the hell out of here, you know. Right, right. So we kind of look at each other. We're not going to argue with Dave Roth. He's our hero, you know. Right. And so we get in the car and we just start laughing. We just talked with Dave Roth and he kicked us off. And we thought it was the greatest thing ever. And then about six months later or three months later, uh, we were playing at a place called the Wood Sound all the time in Monrovia. And uh, the owner and I became pretty good friends. And my sisters used to hang out there. And Dave Roth would show up and Eddie would show up. And uh, for a while there, um, Ian Gillen was sh- hanging out and hanging out with my sisters and their friends. It was all really, you know, hot chicks. And he would be buying them drinks all night and hanging out, telling stories. And they just loved him, thought he was just so great. But Dave would be in there. And my sister would go, hey, you know, like the next day, you know, he'd be telling yeah, Dave Roth came into the club, man. He was so cool, man. And, Man, you know, this, that, and the other. And I'm thinking, man, why am I never there when they're there? So I called up Phil, the owner. I go, man, next time Dave or Eddie's in there, give me a call, man. You know, so uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks later, I get this call. And uh, Phil goes, Greg, Eddie's coming in tonight. Just well, as soon as you come in, just go straight into my office because we'll be in the office. He said he's on his way down. So I get ready and I race down to, to uh, Monrovia, which is probably 25, 20 miles away. Go in there. I knock on the door. Who is it? Door opens up. They let me in. They're doing lines in there. So they're partying, they're partying away. I sit down and I, who am I to say no at this point? You know, I'm in starstruck. There's my, you know, the best guitar player on the planet at the time. And there's a guitar in there. So Eddie and I back and forth with the guitar for hours. We're doing lines. And I mean, this was back when nobody knew how bad that shit was for you. 
and I'm just happy to be in the same room with this guy, you know, and I put my hand, I go to Eddie, let me see how big your hands are. And uh, he puts his hands up and we put our hands together and we aligned this last line right here. And our fingers were the same size. His were a little bit skinnier than mine, but the fingers were the same length, but he was just so much dexterity. You could, you know, and, and he just had that thing, you know, that and thing. We were just talking about that. We were talking the Brad, Brad Tolinsky and Chris, we were talking about his hand size. Cause you know, he has that, he did the rock walk thing, right. Yeah. With his hands in it. And I went there to, check it and see how his hand and they're the same size as mine not really huge hands but yeah. a lot of stretch he even says that in this new book that they put yeah. out where eddie was talking about his hands and that his thumb actually got a little deformed and then he had to have that surgery on one of his fingers yeah and uh, but he the the the, the surgeon guy said what or or the guy said, what is wrong with your thumb because <laughs> apparently he had just whacked it into submission over the years and wow Wow, yeah, it's some crazy stuff, but yeah. yeah. And so I, I remember, I remember that, and uh, that was like a, a highlight. I mean, because I never got to meet Jimi Hendrix, right? You know, I've met all of my heroes. Pretty, I never met Richie Blackmore either. Unfortunately, I, I, I wish hope that happens. But I mean, I spent a day in the studio playing guitar with De uh, Rick. Uh, I know Rick Derringer. I almost got the gig when Danny Johnson left. I was dating Linda Blair at the time, The Exorcist. Oh yeah, I've heard. I've, and, you know she was good friends, best friends with Liz Derringer as, as ex-wife. Okay. And they had me the gig in the band and it just never happened because he decided he was going to start producing and he went with Cindy Lauper and stuff. And, uh, wow. and that just didn't happen. But, uh, um, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Cro a million close calls for me. Wow. You know, it's like, so that, it that, fit. that time that you, uh, you hung out with him, was it like 80, 79? What year was that? With what? When you were all, where you were playing and, and going back and forth with your hands? Oh, it, whenever, it, probably 79 or 80, when uh, probably, probably 79, probably. It was right before their second record came out because they were in the studio recording okay. it. Yeah, so 79. And, uh, but yeah, that was a, that was, a, I mean, I remember sitting in there just going, man, I can't believe I'm sitting here with that Eddie Van Halen. And he was totally cool. To no airs about him. We're just sitting there playing guitar and, back and forth and he's noodling the whole time never you know and i'd take the guitar noodle a bit and phil was just excited to have eddie there and you know right, you know right. they played us all the time danny johnson's wife was booking the club at the time so they loved us and anytime we wanted to play we're in there we always do a good crowd man it was just a fun time yeah i mean nothing like that happens anymore yeah, that i know of. it's so different man and, and you know i saw this big change in about 2008 where you know we started getting all the internet stuff and it's just sort of like too much competing stuff yeah. to, you know, it became yeah. a thing now where I've got to do special events to do, get anybody there. And yeah, too and, many options and everybody's this nowadays. And, They're all yeah. looking at their damn phone. It, it's so hard to, to get people excited about coming to a show, you know, and that's used yeah. to be, like you said, it was the greatest time because everybody went to shows. That's what we yeah. did. We that's went what we did. It was great. Yeah, it was awesome, man. Well, I'm going to let I, you go, man. I appreciate you hanging out today. No, I'm gonna yeah. let you go. No, I'm kidding. Oh, no. I do got to go to work, but my right. work is playing my guitar, so I'm good. Good for you. That's the best job ever. <laughs> best job right. ever. Well, anytime you want to talk or anything, just give me a call and uh, we'll okay. catch up and uh, whatever. And let me give me a link to this once you get it up and edited and stuff. I will, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna edit it kind of like the Van Halen section of it, and then your kind of personal story. All right, cool. Okay. All right, well, you haven't heard my personal story yet, so that's another interview. Seriously, I can, I so can, much. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, so let's get back together and talk about it. Right. Sounds and, great. Uh, you know, if I, you know, if I do a thing where like I get a few guys together, and we can talk about the LA scene or something. That would be kind of cool, right? Somebody, yeah, that'd be fun. 